So this is what we're gonna talk about today is influence. Uh, a lot of folks don't really know what that means and a lot of folks, quite frankly, don't really know what leadership means in the army. If I asked, uh, I won't ask, but if I asked for a show of hands uh, in the room of, of who's an army leader, probably most hands would go up. And then if I asked you to explain to me what that means, you might fumble a little bit. So I'm hopeful that today, after today, you will no longer fumble, that you're gonna have a concrete, 100% sure definition of what it means to be a leader and especially an army leader. This is your reference, ADP 6-22, Army Leadership in the Profession. Uh, to put importance behind this document, this is one of three original ADPs, only three that the Chief of Staff of the Army himself signs. And he, he wrote actually a handwritten foreword to this document. So that tells you this is, this is really important. If, if you wanna know what the bedrock of the army profession and leadership is, it's this document and you should, you should read it. It might take you like 20 minutes, honestly, to read through the entire thing, or at least to get a good understanding of it. I wanna thank our multinational partners. We have some Canadians here, some French. Uh, I don't know if we have any Romanians in the room, but thank you all for coming. Uh, we're, we're thrilled to do multinational training with you. All right, so definitely thank you to the HHB and command team for putting trust in me uh, to deliver such an important topic and to kick off this leadership seminar. All right, let's, let's, let's dive in. So this, this is me. Uh, this, this is my rap sheet for, for the last 20 years in the Army. I wanna draw your attention to specifically that top section there. Uh, what that means is, is I got a crash course in Army leadership and, and the commander that I got that crash course with actually happens to be in the room. Uh, so that was that was Providence, if you will. But Major James was my commander uh, as we served in that unit together. And boy, it's let me tell you, whew, <laughs> my battery was on zero leaving that assignment. It's the second largest company in the army, the largest joint force support company in the army. It it is nested under headquarters battalion, U.S. Army, eight thousand soldier battalion. Uh, so so, what does that mean? Well. This is what it means. It means one day, after a really cool selection process, it was, it was fun, it was sexy even. I got to go through this selection process, seven individuals, and I met the commander, and I'm trying to do my homework and study, and, and I wanna get selected for this job. And it happened, woohoo, that was great. But then the, the very first morning of the job, I pulled in, and this sign kicked me in the chest. <laughs> And some of the leaders in this room and I, CSM Sanders, and uh, I know uh, some of the other leaders who've been in, in command positions and first sergeant and CSM positions, they know this all too well. There's a moment where reality sets in and the responsibility and the weight of what you have just been selected to do kicks you right in the chest. And, and it's a good thing because that means you care and you're passionate about not failing and about doing a great job. So I was sitting in this parking spot, and I'll never forget, it was early one morning, and there was this fog that was kind of over, over the field across from me. I could see soldiers flipping a tire and uh, soldiers running by doing push-ups. And I remember thinking right down here, how, how am I gonna lead in an organization above any other organization where people outrank me by far? The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, right? the Secretary of Defense, the White House. Uh, when you start talking about organizations like this, you start feeling smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And I, here I am, a first sergeant, wearing a brand new diamond, and at the time working with a captain, and we have to influence and lead these organizations. Yikes, that was a tall order. Something else that settled on me that morning is, is what's underlined there. I realized, you know, we really don't have authority over folks most of the time in our career that we desire to lead. You're, you're rarely, in fact, going to have direct authority over a soldier that you need to lead in the Army. I don't know if you know that, but commanders have authority, and everybody else, we serve at, at the behest of the commander, right? So there's a gentleman named John Maxwell. He writes books, uh, Christian books mostly. But he's got a book, and he's got a series of books called The 21 Laws of Leadership. And one of those laws is this. Leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. What he's saying is, is you can be far outranked and far outgunned, 
but, but you can still lead because you can influence. How does that line up with army definitions? Well, the army says leadership is just that. It's the process of influencing people. I'm going to put a period there. There's no period there. The reason I'm going to put a period there is because everything else that, that follows in that definition is what that process does. And I hope you can see that. That's critically important. If you want the answer to the test and the, and the answer to the question I asked you right at the beginning and, and, and the, the situation I posed where, hey, you're an army leader, how do you fumble through you know, what that means or what does that look like? You're an influencer. That's the answer to the test. By this definition, if, if you're an army leader, that means you're influencing people. And if you're not influencing people, you're not an army leader. You're not practicing leadership. We spin this to you differently. So we have a lot of situations in the army where we say we have a leadership challenge, right? We have a leadership problem. We have a soldier who continues to get in trouble. Well, let's rephrase that. Do we have a, a, a leadership problem or do we have an influence problem? Do we have a soldier who just hasn't been influenced by the correct leader? See what, you see where I'm going with that? So according to the army definition, leadership is the process of influencing. We should all sigh a big re a breath of relief because a process has some connotations with it. It means it's not a have or don't. It's, it's a process, which should encourage us all because that means every one of you in here has the capacity and the capability to be a phenomenal army leader. But you just have to practice that process. And we're gonna talk about what that process is today. There's nine methods of influence. And that, that's gonna get you to what the army says it is, is leadership. So what's an army leader? It's someone who practices that process, plain and simple. Now, I would pose a question. I'm, I'm on a pretty tight timeline, so I'm not gonna ask a lot of questions. But if I were to ask you a question to internalize, can a subordinate lead their leader? Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of north-souths, and that's, that's completely accurate. Absolutely true. If we say in the army that, that leadership is influence, then that means a subordinate can absolutely lead anybody. And it's really important that we get that because it also means the battalion commander isn't the only one in the organization who has, who's a leader, right? Or, or leadership isn't only from senior to subordinate. That's critical in a learning organization. Uh, there's a book by Peter Singe called The Fifth Discipline. When I mentioned le le learning organization, I, I recommend you read that book. I have, uh, while operating, I don't, I don't think you can see it, it's in bold up there. Uh, what, what that is referring to is we build airplanes in flight. It's very simple, and, but it's a true fact. You're never gonna be able to pause in the army as a leader and, and then develop and develop and hit play. We, we have to build the airplane while it's flying. And, and that's some ways a fortunate and an unfortunate part of our business. But it also tells you that leadership's a process. It, it just reaffirms that. So what connects the leader uh, to the process or uh, the leadership to the army leader is the process. You enter into that process. That's what makes you an army leader. You're, you're willing to take a step and to learn that process and, and to guide soldiers through that process. But it's nothing without trust. So trust is the confidence held in others that your welfare will be maintained. So when a leader, when a soldier puts their trust in a leader, I remember back to my time with Major James in command, I was doing a barracks inspection as a first sergeant. And, and boy, I've never felt more like a failure in my career as I went into Private Williams' room, PFC Williams. And I said, PFC Williams, why is it so hot in your room? And what do you think she responded? First Sergeant, the AC's broken, right? <laughs> the AC doesn't work, as, as can happen in the Army. So I turned to my platoon sergeants, said, Sergeant Chicarella, Sergeant Fisher, get it fixed. Roger, First Sergeant. So two months later, fast forward, we're going through the barracks inspection. And I go into PFC Williams' room, and it's hot as all get out. PFC Williams, what is going on? Why do you like your room so hot? Well, First Sergeant, the AC's broke again? No, first sergeant. What do you mean, no? She said, well, it was never fixed. So now my pride is, is, is in my ego are starting to rise up and, and bubble up and fume inside of me. Private Williams, why didn't you come back and tell me? 
And this response crippled me to my non-commissioned officer knees. She said, first sergeant, I told you two months ago and, and I just knew you were gonna take care of it. Yikes. Do soldiers trust leaders? Probably more than we deserve, <laughs> right? Which means we've gotta get those two top things right. And that's what we're gonna unpackage here in just a second. Major James and I, our mascot for our company was so appropriately the Mustangs. And I wanted to change it when I got there. I was like, what am I, cause I'm thinking the car really. I was like, why are we the Mustangs? But it turned out to be so appropriate. And let me tell you why. Cause we had a Motley crew. Uh, our, our command was largely administrative and we had a lot of folks who got returned to service for, uni for Uniform Code of Military Justice. So any given day, that commander or that former commander sitting over there on the corner had about 30 to 60 open UCMJ cases. Ridiculous, 3,400 soldiers. It was a nightmare. And so we'd have soldiers and certainly I'm not gonna give you any names or anything, but we'd have soldiers come to us for espionage and child pornography and, and you name it. These are senior leaders in the most senior organizations. And it, and it was so disheartening. And somehow we had to, to take this group of folks and not only lead, but but lead the army way. We had to build trust with them. We had to, to influence them. And it was difficult. It was really hard. Fortunately, I had a great commander to help me through that. But that's why we were kind of appropriately the Mustangs. Because a Mustang is, is what? Who, who raises horses? Or who's, who's been around horses? It's wild, right? It's a wild horse. Uh, it's untamed. It's unbridled. So we had the Mustangs, and then, and then there we are. We were the, the cowboy command team. <laughs> Uh, we, we had horses painted on our wall. It was, we, we just embraced it. So how does that, how does that individual get trust from, from over here? Especially, we're not talking about a, a tame horse, right? We're not talking about a soldier who is, who is joining our unit and, and was happy to be there. Most of the soldiers who came to us had just been, not only were they unhappy, but they had just been through some kind of process and usually they felt like it was unjust and now they're coming to us um, and we have to lead them. That was, that was difficult. So going back to leadership as influence, right? What did we have to do? Well, commander was, was big on this. We had to create a safe environment and a climate where they could thrive. But just because we created it didn't mean that they would enter into it, right? The Mustang horse, if you talk to any horse trainer in the world, they'll tell you it is really difficult to earn the the trust of a horse, especially a wild horse. And so what do we do? Well, we make the environment something that they can benefit in. We would make the environment something that nourished them, that took care of them, right? We make it inviting, we make it something that's gonna meet their needs and it's gonna serve our purpose of, of bringing them into this culture, into this climate and, and getting some work done, you know, for the army, people in readiness, right? And, and that's when we started to see soldiers develop trust in us and, and develop trust in the organization, what we were trying to get them to do. So these are the three things, that, the three definitions. I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page before we even get into what is influence. And if you didn't notice, influence is pretty far down on my list here because there's something we gotta do before, before we can even consider influencing others. And that's, uh, we gotta build down. Right, so, so if you wanna build a skyscraper, I don't know if you know this, but you gotta build down before you can build up. Sounds weird, right? Let me explain. So this is the Park Row building in New York City. The Park Row building, uh, the, the plans, if you look up here at the top, across the top here, that's the only part that's above ground. Everything else here is below ground. It starts with these long, massive beams called piles. And they, and they dry the construction workers. They, they pass the topsoil, they pass the, the clay, they pass the bedrock, or they pass, excuse me, the rock, and they get to the bedrock. And then even that's not enough. They drive these things called piles into that bedrock. 168 piles for this building. Then on top of that, they, they put a layer of concrete. That's, that's this foundational element that holds these piles together, and it, and it creates the platform that you then build everything else on top of the granite the brick more granite you know and then finally this is genius this is where builders are and engineers are just incredible they lay these things across called i-beams they're these big huge iron beams 
And what they do, once they have that, the piles present and they have the concrete foundation, is they allow for minute adjustments. They can adjust these I-beams and it's, it's such an intelligent design. And what they do is, is it, it sets everything below that correctly. It corrects any errors in the foundation or in the piles. And, and they just basically create this perfect uh, platform so that they can then build a building that, that influences the world. So if you haven't picked up on in that analogy, that's, that's what strong leaders are. They're strong towers. We do that through something called character, presence, and intellect. The piles are present, right? We, ha we have to be present as leaders first. It's, it's critically important that we build down before we try to build up and influence somebody over here. We need to have a strong foundational character. We're gonna talk about what all these mean. And then certainly we need to have some intelligence to be able to work on ourselves and develop as leaders. Once we've done that, then we are ready to influence the world and, and certainly the soldiers in our care. Let's dive into it. What is presence? It's being there. It's a picture of, of Major James and I with our, our some of our senior leaders in our organization. We were out at the MLK Memorial running doing PT. If you haven't picked up on this as a leader yet in the Army, I really hope you do. The sucky things. That means the things that are just the worst. <laughs> Getting up early, right? staying up late, going to a formation, those are hard. And those are things that the soldiers usually complain about the most. But when you are, when you are present, it changes that a little bit. Maybe, not, maybe it doesn't make them happy that they're there, but what it does do is it shows you're there to support them. That this isn't just a matter of, of you saying, hey, go out to formation, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna sleep in a little bit, right? As leaders, it's, it's critically important that we're present to support, especially our own initiatives, right? Another example, and this is one of my favorite examples of presence. Uh, his name is Specialist Zolzai. He had just finished aerosol school. So if, if you haven't had the pleasure yet, then I'm sure you will. Uh, this is the CG's priority, right? Uh, we get after aerosol culture. But if you haven't had the pleasure yet, let me tell you, I just went through in December, it was, it was phenomenal. To graduate air assault school is a really cool feeling. And, and the way it works is you're in this formation and these uh, air assault instructors, they come down the line and you have your wings in your hand and, and you can choose who you want to pin you. But not special souls. I just gave mine to the first instructor. It's like, thank you, whew, I survived, I need to get out of here. But not Zolzai. Special Zolz, I walked past 11 different instructors on this particular day. He walked past a crowd of about 150 people and he found Staff Sergeant Carnell, the one person who had influenced him the most. You hear that word? And he said, hey, Sergeant Carnell, will you pin me? Beaming, smile from ear to ear. Now I'm not bringing that to your attention because we've already talked about presence, right? I'm not bringing that to your attention or just being there. I'm bringing it to your attention for another reason. Imagine if Staff Sergeant Carnell wasn't there. Imagine if he had something come up on his way to and decided there was a, a more important priority and Zolzai is gonna graduate anyway. See what I'm saying? It's heavy, right? It's a heavier responsibility as leaders, presence. And lastly, this is Private Williams. Private Williams was one of our favorite troops. She was just, she was humble. She was, she was um, a clean slate, right, in the army. She's that soldier you can mold. She's, she's willing to learn and grow. But she came, and I have her permission to share this. She came into my office one day, and uh, she said, First Sergeant, I'm pregnant. And, and she said, not only am I pregnant, um, the father has already checked out. That hurt, and she, and she said, I, "I don't know what I'm going to do." And I talked to the commander. We said, well, "Gosh, like, how do we deal with that as leaders? We have a soldier here who's pregnant, who the father has checked out very early on, and now her question to me, or her statement to me, was, first sergeant, I can't afford this. I'm, I don't need. I'm still feel like a kid myself. I, I just don't know what to do. Sometimes presence is is emotional presence too." And, and support. Sometimes it's financial support. I'm not telling you open up your wallet and give money. But this was my statement uh, to Private Williams. And this is the, the message the commander and I sent. 
you worry about being a good mother, we will worry about where stuff comes from. Six months later, fast forward. Uh, well, this, this was the result of that, right? Commander and I put out some, put out some notices and, and the community just rallied behind this soldier like you wouldn't believe. And six months later, Private Williams came to my office and she said, hey, First Sergeant, I just want you to know um, that day I came and talked to you, I had another appointment and it was for a couple days later at a clinic and, and they had a different solution to this problem. And I'm so glad that you and the commander supported me. Sometimes presence, that support, right? Those piles on the very bottom of the building, sometimes it's emotional too. I was crying like a baby. <laughs> I really was. That one, that one got me. All right, so the army says we also have to be leaders of character. We can't just be present. We can't just be there. We have to have character. What does that mean? Well, the army tells you that that's your moral and ethical qualities. So what are moral, morals and ethics? I'll tell you. Thank you for asking Morals are absolutes. It's right and wrong. There's, there's no gray area. It's something is, is either true or not true. If I can give you a, an example, I'm a 56 Mike, right? A religious affairs NCO. So one of the examples that we talk about a lot is, is like the Ten Commandments in the Bible or, or any other religion, you know, and they're, they're tenets of their faith. There are absolutes. You will do this. You won't do this. You will, uh, you will not take the, the name of God in vain, right? So... For someone of the Christian persuasion, that's a no-no, ever. It's never okay to do that. There's never like a, a weekend where that doesn't apply, right? Like that's, that's, that's a moral. Morals are absolutes. In the army, what a moral is, is it's called doctrine. They're called army regulations. For a leader in the army, morals are the absolutes that we all say, we, when we raise our right hand, we will obey these things. Or we will, we will not do these things. We will not steal from the PX, right? We will live the army values. Those are morals, absolutes. No room for failure or no gray area. Do we fail and do mistakes happen? Absolutely. But then we, as leaders, we check ourselves and we, we get ourselves right. So ethics is the moral and ethical qualities. Ethics is the area in between something that's morally right or wrong. It's not... A, it's not tied to morals in a sense. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought morals were already up there. So ethics is that area in between. And, and what ethics are, are the, the application of moral principles. That's fancy talk for saying it's taking what you know about morals, and morally right or morally wrong, and applying it to every situation, like the best that it can apply. It's finding what's the best answer, what's the good answer versus the bad answer. And it's going to look different for every leader. It really is, because they're not morals. And so one example would be, is it, is it okay for me to, to take my squad every Friday to a bar and have a drink? On me. I'm just going to buy them all one drink. We're going to talk about business that week, and then, and then we're going to head out. Well, there, there's no moral answer to that in regulation. There's no regulation that's going to tell you that's wrong. There's no regulation that's going to tell you that's right. So then you get into this ethical dilemma. Is, is it good or is it bad? And that's for you as leaders to decide. That's for you as leaders of character to apply the moral principles and the army values to that decision and determine if it's the best thing to do. You with me? All right. So here's some examples of that. You have an off-color joke. And I'm not talking about sharp infraction. I'm not talking because that would be morally wrong. But just something that maybe is, is a little on the edge of, of a joke that maybe you want to tell in front of your mother, right? Or, or something like that. You know, you may consider that unethical. Using profanity in business communication. Is it, is it, it's not morally wrong, morally right. You know, we, we, we know as an army, we don't typically prosecute folks for that under UCMJ, but is it best? And as leaders, we always operate above this line. You know, you got sponsored EO training, right? A response to a situation you may have had, you know, where you applied the army values. Those would be examples of things that are ethical or morally right. As leaders, we always live above this line, and this is why. Right there, because soldiers are watching all the time. This over here is the reason that we live above that line. And you can see, I put those two ranks up there, and that's just a representation of all of us. That's where soldiers put us. When they see a leader in the army, when they see a, a, a major and a first sergeant, 
or anything, any, any flavor of leader, they believe that we always act morally and ethically. And this is, this is the gotcha as a leader. If they see us doing anything that, that belongs down here, they are often not going to say, I put the leader down below that line now. No, what they'll do is, is they'll move that behavior above the line. And that's far worse. And that's far more important reason for us to, to operate above that line. Because when soldiers see us doing that, it's rare. They will sometimes. Sometimes they'll take the leader and they'll say, that's an unethical leader. That's a toxic leader. But most of the time, they're going to say, no, that's a pretty good leader, and they do this, so I'm going to do that. Uh, you know, they, they use the TMP to go to the restaurant, but they kill it, you know, on the co-ed floor. Yikes. And now what they've just done is they've elevated that behavior that is more un immoral or unethical to a standard where they believe you exist to a plane on which they think you're always operating. You with me? Yeah. Woo. That's heavy. That one gets me too. So what's intellect? I'm not going to read the definition for you. But what I am going to do is hopefully offer you some unique perspective on intellect. Intellect is, is your application of the science and the art of leadership. It's improving yourself. Talked about that a little bit in the intro and at the beginning. But ethics, or excuse me, uh, intellect is, is your application of, of the science and the art. It's your ability to understand those things and improve in those things. It's your ability to make those subtle adjustments like the eye beams, right? So you, you have your presence, you have your character in check, and now you have the eye beams. You're making these minute adjustments so that you can, you can then influence. So what's the science and the art? Well, science is, is just that. It's, it's put on a lab coat, okay? It's strictly governed, it's army doctrine. It's, it's the same everywhere you go. Um, it's slow to change. What, has anybody in here been part of TRADOC before? <laughs> right, enough said. No, for those of you who have not, TRADOC is the slowest turning ship in the army, but, but for good reason. They're scientists. They're teaching students in classrooms all over the world. And what they're teaching has to be vetted and validated, and it has to pass the test, okay? So sometimes, if you've been in that position teaching AIT or drill sergeant, you know, hey, this, this doctrine was updated a year ago, and we're teaching, we're still teaching it today. I see some, some head nods. It's because it's a slow turning ship. Science does not change overnight. It has to be vetted. If you know, what, if you know anything about the, the scientific method and the peer reviewed process, it's very similar to army doctrine and how army doctrine changes. It has to go through an entire process. It has to be vetted, it has to be validated and tested. And then finally the change happens. The science of leadership seeks enterprise solutions. That's a fancy Pentagon word for we want to do it all the same across the army because it's, it's cost effective. The science, and, and, and not only that, but then we have a widely held standard. We know that everybody is seeing it the same way. If Master Sergeant Hall is training PRT and doing this warm up with the two new moves, right, Sergeant Blackstad? Three new moves, thank you. With the three new uh, warm ups, right? Then in, in Fort Lewis, Washington, they're doing it the same way. So, what's the art? That's, that's the science of leadership. What's the art of leadership? It operates within the same intent of, of the science. It never is going to go, one is not going to go against the other. You're not going to have the science of leadership saying, uh, soldiers will be physically fit and the art going, well, <laughs> maybe you don't have to be so fit. No, that doesn't happen. So make sure that we always, when, we're, when, we're, when I talk about the art of leading and we're artists, it's, it's never outside of that intent. It's influenced by great examples. So where the science is higher to lower, it's always communicated from higher to lower to set the, the standards and the expectations. The art of leading is just influenced by, by who you decide to let influence you. Kind of like mentorship. AD, ADP 6-22 says you select your mentors. So when, when Major James and I were uh, on the company command team, there were many nights where it was, uh, ma'am, I'm on the way to, to the MP station. Or ma'am, I'm going to a domestic incident. Where, where should my head be, ma'am? And, and she would guide me, you know, hey, this is, this is how we need to view this situation, this is what, and we, we would sing. And then my very next call, when I hung up with Major James, was to Sergeant Major Retired Carlos Clausel. 
my mentor, Sarge Major. He was a first sergeant as well. Sergeant Major, this is where my head is. This is what, what happened tonight. Where should my head be? Because I wanted to be an artist. I didn't want to just go into a situation with, with fire and brimstone and army doctrine, right? I wanted to show up and be value added and help improve that situation. And I needed leaders outside of my own perspective to help guide, you know, maybe teach me some new techniques with my paintbrush. Allows for rapid adjustment. We've all been in the in the meetings with the commander and and we talk about an SOP or we talk about a standard or sir or ma'am, this is why we have to do it this way. And the commander goes, nope, you're gonna do it that way, <laughs> right? <laughs> Sometimes commanders are artists and we all shift and adjust. It's very rapid. You don't have to wait a year like trade off to see that come. And lastly, creative budget, budget solutions. It could be less or, or more expensive than an enterprise solution. This is how I like to remember it. Science is an equation, art's inspiration. And as an army leader, you gotta balance these two things, especially when we get into influencing soldiers. So how do we influence? Finally, we've built down enough. Uh, and if you haven't received anything yet uh, from, from this training, I hope that you're, you're receiving that there's some work to do before we decide to go and influence. The Army expects us to be leaders of presence, intellect, and character before we decide to go influence others. Because we're probably gonna lead them astray if we're not. Well, the Army gives us nine methods. And these are the two goals of those methods. We either want to obtain compliance or we want to build commitment. Now, you're all intelligent leaders. I know no doubt you know building commitment's better. This is getting them to say, yes, Master Sergeant, rockin', we'll do it. This is getting them to say, I want to do it. Big difference, right? However, I don't want you to get lost in that as Army leaders because the Army tells you that in all of these nine methods, there are times and places for each of them. There are times where you need to obtain compliance. If you're on a fire line, it might be time to put some pressure on somebody, right? Combat arms, I mean combat arms, yeah. So, so if you've got a hole in your line, I doubt it's time to have a, a long conversation or rationalize with a soldier about why they should go over there and fill the, the gap, right? No, it's get your butt over there or else we're gonna be overrun, right? So that, that's an example of pressure. Pressure is very quick. It's a good method of influence when you have very little time to get something done. What's a con to pressure? Well, it does just that, it builds pressure. If you picture a soldier who's constantly being given last minute tasks and constantly uh, being expected to execute with very little notice, just like a pressure cooker, eventually their, their top's gonna pop off, right? And they may do something that, that we wouldn't want them to do under normal circumstances. Legitimating is, is very similar. It's, it's always bringing your rank into play. So at face value, that may seem egotistical, right? You may seem like an egomaniac. You may seem like, oh, you know, we all know you're right. But the army, and, and rightfully so, recognizes that as a legitimate method of influence. And there's a time for it. There's a time that people need to be reminded, hey, you don't just walk past a master sergeant on your way to chow, you give the greeting of the day, right? Good order and discipline always. And sometimes we gotta remind soldiers of that, especially the non-commissioned officers in the room. Like we're the standard bearers for that. Uh, it's, it's probably not so good though to pull out your rank every now and then and go, hey, I wanna make this decision, I see you're against it, let's play rock, paper, rank, right? Let's determine who's right here by playing a game of rock, paper, rank. That's probably the egotistical version that we need to avoid. So, so both of these have pros. They're both pretty quick. They're both supported and founded in army doctrine. You're gonna have no problem justifying that as an army leader. However, there, there's obviously the, the, the negative side to, to using these two methods. And if you, especially if you overuse them where you wear soldiers out and, and you create too much pressure. All right, so that moving a little bit further toward the right toward the right and building commitment, we have a few other options here. Rational persuasion. So this is great if you have time. Rational persuasion takes a lot of time though, because what you're doing is you're saying, I have a soldier who's, who's maybe an intellectual, and what I want to do is, is I want them to, to play this game with me where I help get them to understand and put those puzzle pieces together. You can see here it's a jumbled mess. I want to get them here where all those pieces are locked in tight and they, and they understand and now they're ready to support. 
this can actually be really great with the right soldier and given the right amount of time because it might even build commitment to the organization if, if you can rationalize with them. Obviously, the con in, in trying to use rationalization is, is it's very time consuming. And even worse, you might get it to that soldier who out-rationalizes you. <laughs> Uh-oh. And now you're a leader who, who's just tried to rationalize with a soldier who's a little smarter than you. And now they still have to do it, but now they don't understand why they have to do it. And also, it can, it can put you in a situation where you're continually having to rationalize. And, and now the soldier gets this expectation that if, if they're not understanding what it is you need them to do, then they don't have to do it, or they shouldn't do it. So be careful. It, there's, a, there's a time and place for all of these. ADP 6-22, definitely read it. Apprising. So this is kind of like a, a real estate agent, right? You want them to see the value in this house that you're selling. That's great. If they see the value, again, maybe it builds commitment, or maybe it obtains compliance. It, these are kind of wild cards in, in that realm. The, the, the pro is if, if they do see the value in it, then they're absolutely going to be right on board with you. And now you've built an agent for the unit that's going to do great work. The con to that, right, it's probably self-explanatory at this, at this point, but they may want you to always help them see the value. Or worse, if they don't see the value, again, hey, I'm not going to do that. You tell them, hey, go, go into this city over here and protect this building that's going to be a future command post for us. It's going to save the United States government $48,000. So we need to go secure that building. And that soldier might go, well, I think my life is worth more than $48,000, sir. <laughs> so I don't really want to do that, right? So sometimes apprising something isn't the best way uh, to, to lead a soldier, to influence a soldier. Sometimes it is. Uh, exchange, we're, we're probably all intelligent enough to figure that out. It's this for that. Everybody wins, right? Hey, if, if, you're, if you pull this guard duty for the next 24 hours, then I'm going to make sure you have a day off next week. Everybody wins, right? So, so the, the con to that can be then, then there's an expectation, right? We're soldiers. We all signed up for this duty. We all raised our right hand and, and said we would follow lawful orders. And that has to be enough. We can't allow soldiers to get to the point where that's not enough to do their job. And we as leaders influence that. Sure, is it, is it good to reward soldiers every now and then? Absolutely. The Army says this is a valid method of influence. But we just have to be careful to make sure it doesn't get to that point where now it's an expectation and, and my paycheck's not enough. How are you going to incentivize me to listen to you? Got to be careful not to get to that point. All right, moving a little further to the right. These are wonderful, inspirational appeals. These are the Mel Gibson movie speeches. This is when the commander was back in Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall, standing before the formation, and it started to rain a little bit. And, and anybody who's seen a Hollywood movie before knows when a commander is talking in the rain, whatever she says or he says is gonna be brilliant. And it's gonna bring a tear to everybody's eye. Absolutely, inspirational appeals are phenomenal. Even just painting the picture that I just painted, you're probably like, yeah, I want to hear what she was going to say, right? It's inspirational. It, it motivates us to take the hill. The problem with inspirational appeals, okay, they're great, but they have a shelf life. If the boss was to stand in front of us, the boss meaning the, the battalion commander, if he was to stand in front of us before we came and said, hey, look, we're going to deter Russian aggression, right? We're going to go take care of people, uh, you know, we're going to make sure that the, what the Russians are doing in Ukraine doesn't happen to any one of our allies. That's why we're doing this. Let's go get them. Rah! Right? It's inspirational. But what happens when we're a month down the road, and two months, and three months, and six months, and nine months later? Does that speech matter anymore? Not at all. <laughs> right? But it has a shelf life. So be, just be aware of that. If you're going to use inspirational appeals to inspire and influence soldiers, be aware that, that that's limited. Personal appeals, very similar, except, except they draw attention to self. Hey, uh, Sergeant Westbrook, I need you to do this for me, man. I, I need you to come through for me, right? And, and if Sergeant Westbrook and I have a good relationship, especially if he, if he knows me to be a leader of character, presence, and intellect, he's probably going to say, absolutely, I got you covered. I'm not going to fail and let you down. That's wonderful. 
It still, it may build organizational commitment. It may just be a, a means of obtaining compliance. But where we have to be careful with inspirational appeals, when we're talking to our junior soldiers especially, is we don't want them loyal to us. We want them loyal to an organization. I don't want you to be loyal and, and to complete your job just because you like me, because I'm setting my successor up for failure. Because leaders change in the army, right? We all know that. And the last thing I want is you to be committed to me, and then my successor comes in and you're like, I wanna go with Master Sergeant Hall. I don't like you, right? We don't want that. So, so make sure that when we're using personal appeals, that we're not overusing them to the point that the soldiers are investing in you and they, that they're not committed to the organization. Because that's what the Army asks of us as leaders. Get people committed to the Army organization. And then the last, collaboration participation. They're, they're the two methods that build the most organizational commitment. So obviously the Army would prefer that we get to this point. Well, it takes a long time to get to this point. This doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lot of patience from, from a commander. It takes a lot of patience from leaders to get soldiers to the point, collaboration where, where you've made them a part of the system, where they're part of the decision-making process, where they have influence, where they feel like the, at different multiple layers without the unit, they, they make a difference, right? Their leadership matters and it affects the bigger picture. It's hard to get there. It's slow. That's the con. We all know the, the pros of this. We know the pros of a, of a soldier who's committed to our organization. Participation is great too. Uh, the, the one thing I'd caution you with participation, what does that look like? That means if Sergeant Peterson goes out to his squad and says, hey, uh, tomorrow morning the CSM wants us to walk out to the motor pool and PS, PMCS five trucks, right? I'm gonna be the first one out there to make sure that we're, we're doing that correctly. That's wonderful. Not, I would never take anything away from that. However, what if there's soldiers, you know, back in the rear, or let's change that scenario. What if it's a gun truck? Hey, we're going out the wire. I'm gonna be in the first gun truck. That's great, that's great. You're leading from the front, builds organizational commitment. The soldiers see you're committed to the organization, so they will be as well. But what happens if that truck gets hit, right? And the leader goes down. Or what happens if, if something's going on back in the wire, and maybe you should have been there for that. So, so it just takes thinking ahead and planning ahead, multiple layers of accountability and, and thought process. These are slow. To get to that point where you can do this effectively is challenging, especially in, in an organization uh, where everybody outranks you. <laughs> it really is. I see some head nods. Uh, and I, I put a note on the bottom there. Media is a wonderful tool. Influence isn't only face-to-face uh, -face engagement. PAO's smiling, he's like, yep, I know it is. He's like, I, I influence people all the time. <laughs> Absolutely. You can lead by making a good presentation. That, that might make you pay attention just a little bit more to what Master John Hall is saying, if it just looks professional, right? Is that leadership? Is it influence? Absolutely, yes. So sometimes take the time uh, to, to invest in, inside of, in, into media products, into things that are gonna make uh, soldiers more receptive to what you have to say. One of, the, one of the leaders who's gonna be on the leadership panel, I said, you're making us look like superheroes, Master Sergeant. I said, absolutely, because, because I want the soldiers to listen to every word you have to say. And I know you're gonna to listen to them because they're a phenomenal panel. Am I leading even though I'm not on the panel? Does that make me a leader if I set that up and I, and I make that slide and, and I get you to listen to them just a little bit more? Absolutely, that's leadership, that's influence. So, so don't be afraid to use media as well. All right, so who are we leading? Now we know how to influence. Who are we influencing? When we purpose, motivation, direction, that's the answer to the test. That's, that's what we're influencing. So, so what are soldiers of purpose? Soldiers of purpose come in, in, four, in four sort of models, and this is broad and this is general. You have, you have a consciously on purpose soldier, the stubborn, right? This is, we often refer to them as the 10% where you spend 90% of your time. And, and I'm not saying that that's wrong. We all are on this, on this journey of practicing the art of leadership and, and practicing influence, the process, right? However, I will tell you, for Master Sergeant Hall, I would never spend 90% of my time on this guy, ever, because I think it's wasted. I think 
if, and not to make you do mathematics right now and, and equations and percentages and statistics, but I would say 90% of the 90% of the time you give that solar is wasted. And you have a whole other 90% of your soldiers who would benefit and value that time. So that's for you as a leader to figure out. I'm not attacking you. I'm not, I certainly, if you're like, nope, I wanna bring that soldier up to be my highest performing soldier. If you can accomplish that, that's wonderful. So how do we get through to the, the consciously unpurposed? I know that I'm not within the unit's purpose and I don't care. <laughs> that's, that's this soldier. So how do we influence that soldier? It's difficult. That's, that's the answer, it's difficult. I would suggest that it's somewhere in, into, into elevating their self-interests into the team's mission. In some way, shape, or form, you've got to find a way to connect them to their original oath and their commitment to the army. And, and that varies too. It's difficult. But you have nine methods of influence to help you do that. And sometimes, again, when all else fails, sometimes we just need soldiers to comply. The army says that's okay. Sometimes you just put some pressure where pressure needs to be, and that's okay. Next, you have our unconsciously unpurposed, the clueless soldier, okay? These are my titles. Don't go calling your soldier clueless. <laughs> but, but just to communicate uh, very briefly the type of soldier, it's, it's unfortunately the stereotypical lieutenant, right? Second lieutenant or the stereotypical private who just doesn't know what they don't know. Another, another term for this, what I would call the blank slate. You should love it when you get this kind of soldier because now you have the opportunity to mold them. You have the opportunity to use nine methods of influence to turn them into a lethal warfighter. That's incredible. And, and it's on your shoulders. We have the unconsciously purpose, the gifted, the talented. They're, they are so all over it and they don't even know it. That we need to tie them into the, into the army's purposes, getting after people in readiness, getting them on the, the, the commander's priorities, right? That's all this soldier needs. They just need your help in, in, in readjusting their compass, but be careful not to crush that talent, right? Or, or their, their willingness to, to do what you need them to do. And lastly, you have the consciously purpose, the dependable. This is your lethal set it and forget it soldier. If you get one of these, congratulations. The one thing I would caution you with is, is don't forget about them. If you're the 90% over here and the 10% over here, realize that that soldier sees that too. Realize that that high-speed soldier who's, who's always dependable and always there for you sees how little time you spend with them and developing them. I had a gut check on that this week. I was counseling some of my brigade NCOs, and, and one of my NCOs said, Master Sergeant, I feel, like, I feel like you don't spend a lot of time with me. I was like, Gosh, that's hard to hear. He, he's my ace, right? He's the set it and forget it. And, and here... Uh, I wasn't following my own guidance. You know, I was spending more time with the soldiers who needed more development instead of continuing to develop this leader and multiplying him across the formation. So that's purpose. We got to give direction. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. It's just make a roadmap. Tell your soldiers what to do. There's, there is old Sergeant Major wisdom, though, that says inspect what you expect. And, and I think you should write that down. If you've never heard that before, inspect what you expect. Once you've given a soldier a roadmap, if you're not inspecting, if you're not checking, if you're not making sure that they're tracking and, and on target, then you can't blame them when they wind up at a different finish line. And lastly, motivation. I love this definition. This is straight out of the ADP. The, the underlying portion in particular, elevate their individual desires into the team's goals. That's how we motivate soldiers. That's what the army says. When we want to motivate somebody uh, to do more, to, to exceed the standard, right? Then we elevate their self-interest into the team goals. We know our soldiers, we're present, right? We have intellect and we use those things to know what our soldiers desire and want and need. Okay, so you want to go uh, to college, right? And, and, and so my, my goal then as a leader is to tie that into our mission. Well, hey, look, tell you what, if, if, you, can, if you can help manage your time, then I'm gonna make sure the last two hours of every day, I'm gonna kick you out of the office and you're gonna work on college, period, right? So find some way that you can elevate what they desire to do into the team's mission. 
or, or at least into accomplishing the mission to a high standard. Here's an example. I'd like to get promoted for my family. Well, shucks, I'd like to see that too. And, and if you, if you I tell you what, if you execute this next mission to a high standard, I'm going to make sure that the command sees it. I'm going to make sure that first sergeant knows you're, you, you need to be in line for that waiver for promotion. Absolutely. There's not a soldier in the army who's going to say no to that, right? And then hopefully that's what we accomplish. The mission's complete and we're taking care of soldiers. So that's what we want to influence. When we talk about the, the art of influence uh, and influence as it relates to leadership, what we're saying is, first, we build down before we build up, right? We develop our own presence, character, and intellect. As an army leader, we've always got to do that before we get to the point that we're trying to be the Park Row building in New York City. Before we're trying to get soldiers to follow us. We have a higher responsibility than, than just getting them to follow us because we're wearing a rank, right? We want to make sure that we're balancing the science and the art with our intellect, and, and most importantly, we want to get them to a point of organizational commitment. But leadership is influence, nothing more and nothing less. Maxwell, if you want to check out his book, that's it. Uh, I hope that I've added a little bit of perspective to you today on what leadership is. I hope that uh, if nothing else, you're walking away here having learned something, uh, but, but this is what we do as army leaders. When somebody asks you, if, are you an army leader? Yeah, what does that mean? It means I'm an influencer. I hope that's the answer. And I hope that you take that seriously because, because that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna put more soldiers with you and more soldiers under your, your lead and we're gonna ask you to influence them uh, to build commitment for the army. That's all I have. Thank cool. you so much. <laughs>